The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. It is my pleasure now to introduce uh, one of the great women uh, who represent our city uh, and our country uh, in Congress. Uh, Carolyn Maloney was first elected a Congresswoman in 1992, and it was the first woman to represent New York's 12th Congressional District, an area covering Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. Uh, in her more than two decades representing uh, our city, uh, Carolyn has worked on issues of vital importance to our nation, to the city, and to our country uh, and ABNY. After September 11th, Carolyn helped author and pass legislation that provided health care and compensation for 9-11 responders, um, and one of the, the first steps of our city to help recover and uh, move forward. Following Hurricane Sandy, Carolyn helped ensure that the passage of flood relief passed Congress, and this past December, uh, she was instrumental on an important issue uh, for our city and our country, and that was extending terrorism risk insurance. We spoke almost on a daily basis, uh, working to make sure uh, that Congress passed uh, that important piece of legislation. Um, so we thank you, Carolyn, for your tremendous efforts uh, on, those, uh, on those issues. But I think Carolyn is really at the forefront of infrastructure uh, for our city, working so hard on the 2nd Avenue subway, uh, east side access, uh, and so many other uh, infrastructure projects that are so vital for the economic vitality of our city. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Congressman Carolyn Maloney. Thank you so much, uh, Bill, and for everything that you do, and thank all of you for coming. And it is a, a really great honor for me to speak today um, with one of the greatest civic organizations in, in, in New York City. I've always uh, loved ABNY. I never missed a meeting when I was on the city council, but now I'm in Washington. I can rarely get here. Uh, but I remember when you were formed, I uh, worked for the New York State Legislature for the city's committee. and. Uh, Ford had that great headline, that terrible headline, New York City dropped dead. And uh, Lou Rudin and uh, Victor Gottbaum, the great labor leader, and uh, Felix Royton uh, came together and literally saved our city and, and brought us out of financial insolvency. And since then, uh, ABNY has continued to be an unparalleled forum for the exchange of ideas, providing a path forward and actually solving problems that affect our city and the region. None of this could have happened or would happen without the commitment and leadership of Bill Rudin. Thank you so much, Bill. <laughs> New York City is the greatest city in the world. That's what uh, Mayor Dinkins used to tell me all the time, and he's right. We are the global leader in finance, communications, media, publishing, and fashion. And this year, the Mets actually made it to the World Series. And we have a Mets hero here. Art Shamsky, who played in the 1969 World Series and won with the Jets, the Mets. And he's got a book, The Magnificent Season, uh, that uh, illustrates that wonderful win that we had. Uh, and we set a new record for tourism last year with 56 million visitors, which translates into over 61 billion in economic activity. And I, I think what would even give us more economic activity if we could finally get those two giant pandas that Margot and John Casamitidis <laughs> have been. We don't have them yet, but we appreciate your efforts very much. Uh, and, and New York uh, has become a leader in high tech, attracting companies from around the world, including Google, Uber, Amazon, and Pandora. And, and they have all uh, built a magnificent presence in, in New York, and, and most of them are headquartered in my district. Uh, they came to New York to attract the talented, creative people who are looking for the excitement that you can always find here. 
world-class academic institutions are helping fuel that activity, and higher education is big business in New York, uh, with well over half a million undergraduates and graduate students attending school here, including 400,000 that go to CUNY. And I am so pleased that some of the leadership of CUNY is here. Thank you so much for the great work that you do for our city and for our people. And we are proud to welcome the newest academic institution, Cornell Tech, which is building a new high-tech campus on Roosevelt Island in my district. And uh, all of the electeds, uh, we all fought very hard to make sure that Roosevelt Island would be selected as the site for this new innovative school. Uh, Cornell Tech is building its campus. It is scheduled to open in 2017, but it has already opened its doors to the first classes at space that is shared with Google. And along with the New York uh, delegation, our senators and our Congress members, we cut the red tape, and for the first time in history, we got a U.S. patent office to partner with Cornell Tech, even before the school's built, uh, to provide guidance and helping uh, entrepreneurs as they bring their ideas to market. Uh, there were a lot of bumps on the road, but we made it happen, uh, and the new high-tech campus will be a major generator of businesses and jobs, and many of these new businesses will settle in Western Queens, which has the space and is eager to welcome them. In the years since I first started representing Western Queens, it has grown into a major business center filled with startups, film studies, studios, and Fortune 500s like City uh, Bank and JetBlue. Some of the finest hospitals and medical schools in the world are in New York, including the 9-11 Health Center at Mount Sinai, which serves our first responders who were made ill as a result of their service at Ground Zero. It is the leading research institution in the world on environmental health and science and research. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Landrigan, who's here, who heads that, that research facility. Thank you, Dr. Landrigan. And we have uh, Sloan Kettering with Cutting Edge Cancer Research, Rockefeller University, which has led on the Genome Project here in New York. And extraordinary, uh, groundbreaking research taking place at uh, Presbyterian Langone, to name a few. But we're now trying to make sure that they stay and develop this research in New York, in the industrial zones in both Queens and in Brooklyn. Uh, the, the, and while I'm celebrating everything about New York, there's one other reason to love the city. The census data shows that New Yorkers live longer. The city literally gives you energy and life because we walk more, and I think we are all just too busy to die. <laughs> And, and the fundamental element that ties us all together and connects us, it is our infrastructure. It's our lifeblood moving people through our city quickly and efficiently, and our region serves one out of three mass transit riders in the, in the whole nation. New, the New York City subway system is the busiest in the Americas, with more stations covering more miles than any other system in the entire world. On an average weekday, it moves more than five and a half million passengers, six million on a weekend. And in the course of a year, it transports more passengers than the entire population of the United States and China combined. Our transit system is the result of the vision and foresight of our city's leaders a century ago, and it offers a challenge to us today to keep New York moving and to keep New York growing. So when I first came to Congress, one of my priorities was to help improve this system and to finally build the Second Avenue subway. We have not expanded our transportation systems in more than a half a century, and our highway, subways, and railroads are all at capacity. One of the first projects that the delegation uh, accomplished working together, our senators and our uh, members of Congress, and our great dean of our delegation is here, Charlie Rangel. Nydia Velasquez is supposed to be here, or so she said. And so one of our first proposals was to complete the 63rd Street Tunnel Connector bringing the F train through a tunnel that had never been used and providing service 
to Queens, Roosevelt Island, and Manhattan. Uh, the federal government contributed over $300 million out of a total of $600 million for the project. The tunnel to nowhere became the tunnel to somewhere. And uh, we're proud of having made that happen. And today, two of the largest transit projects, not in the city, not in the state, but in the entire country, are in the district that I am privileged to represent, and that is the Second Avenue subway and the East Side Connector. These projects are creating nearly 50,000 good paying jobs, labor jobs, and, and billions in economic uh, activity, and it's uh, moving us into the 21st century. The Second Avenue sub subway was first proposed nearly a century ago. And since then, it has gone through numerous starts and stops. But the MTA is promising to open the first portion, which is between 98th Street and 63rd Street in December of 2016. On day one, it will move over 200,000 New Yorkers and will include four stops at 96, 86, 72nd, and 63rd Street. The, F the FTA tells me that this is the largest subway s project in the whole nation, and they say that the work that the MTA has done on it is among the best they have ever seen. So we should be very proud of it, and those of us who ride the Lexington Avenue line know that it is there's a limit to how many people you can stuff into the subway at, at rush hour. This, this subway is sorely needed. And at 63rd Street, it will connect with the existing Q train service that will allow it to travel down the west side to Wall Street and to Brooklyn. This is the first new line and major expansion of the subway system in our great city in over 60 years. So we're building all of this with $3.1 billion from the state and $1.3 billion in federal funding that is already appropriated and in hand. The New York dele delegation made this a top priority and uh, fought incredibly hard for this federal funding to help make this happen. But we need to get go going right away on the second phase, which will extend the subway up to 125th Street. And that's why I'm urging every elected official in the city and state to work together to restore the billion dollars removed from the MTA capital plan so construction can continue on the Second Avenue subway now. That, that has been the sad story of the Second Avenue subway. For decades, the money was put in to the Second Avenue subway, and then someone finds a way or a reason to take it out. And understand that my, my support comes in the form of action and not just mere, mere words. And uh, as we leave this breakfast, uh, Charlie Wrangle and I and other members of the delegation and uh, uh, elected officials, uh, Rebecca C. Wright, who's here with us, our assemblywoman, and um, Dan Garodnik, our council member, and many others, we will be meeting with the MTA on, in our efforts to move this project forward. And I want to invite Abney to join us at this meeting, and the labor movement to join us at this meeting, and to let the MTA know that they can't take the money out of the Second Avenue subway, or we will never complete it. And uh, after we finish phase two, we have to then start on phase three and four and go all the way down to the financial uh, district. And I would say that it would be great if this project that was planned uh, before many of us were born in this room were completed uh, while we're still alive. So I would like to see this, I'd like to see this subway uh, completed and, and uh, we need your help to make that happen. And it will make a huge difference uh, in creating jobs, spurring economic growth, and just plain improving the quality of life in our great city. And there's another huge project in my district. It's the East Side Access, which will provide direct services on the Long Island Railroad to Grand Central with a new eight-track terminal and concourse. And uh, we are liberating 160,000 commuters from the hassle 
of having to travel all the way to Penn Station before heading to their jobs on Manhattan's uh, east side. But that's not all. This project will expand retail space at Grand Central with a 375,000 square foot uh, concourse. It will modernize Grand Central. And when completed, the federal government will have pumped in 2.6 billion of the 10 billion for the east side access project. Uh, in this project, uh, actually, uh, I reached across the aisle and worked with Senator Alphonse D'Amato and now Pres uh, Congressman Peter King to get the funding uh, that we needed. And what we decided to do is that we would move both the East Side Access and the Second Avenue subway as a team effort, uh, com combining Republican and Democratic support, and that we would move the projects together and make sure that both of them got the funding that they deserved. But my real dream is to build high-speed rail in the Northeast Corridor, the busiest corridor in the entire nation. So when a Florida gave back its high-speed rail money, which I couldn't believe, I, I jumped at the opportunity, met immediately with the MTA, and urged the state to try to get it for our, our high-speed rail project. Governor Cuomo put in an incredible effort and was totally behind this and helped secure over $300 million in federal funds to in, uh, invest it in, in, in uh, working on a bottleneck in Queens uh, where Amtrak New Jersey Transit and the LIR are, uh, compete to use the same rails. And what this money is being used for is to give each system their own dedicated tracks and pave the way for real high-speed rail in the Northeast Corridor. The Northeast Corridor is the only area in the entire nation where Amtrak shows an operating profit. Uh, so we really should be able to build this and uh, show that uh, high-speed rail uh, is needed here on the Northeast Corridor. But our infrastructure upgrades can't stop with our transit system. And I am uh, very privileged to represent both Queens and Brooklyn. And that's why New York is making important uh, upgrades in, in three important uh, bridges in our metropolitan area, the Kosciuszko Bridge, the Tappan Zee, and the Gothels Bridge. They are all being replaced with brand new state-of-the-art cable-stayed bridges. And I toured the Kosciuszko earlier this week, and I predict it will be the first of these three uh, great bridges to be completed. Uh, back in 2013, I issued a report on the sorry state of this bridge. It is the slowest and most accident prone in the entire uh, state. It has six times as many accidents as a typical six lane highway. In short, it is a disaster. And if you've ever tried to uh, cross it, there are great delays. Construction is well underway now. The towers are rising, and a new bridge is being built alongside the existing one. Once that is done, the old bridge will be torn down, and a new one will rise in its place. And I'm happy to say four years after construction begins, we believe this new bridge will be opening for traffic in 2017. There will ultimately be uh, uh, two side-by-side -side bridges and a new pedestrian path and bikeway. And to uh, give back to the community, the Department of Transportation is building two parks, one in the Queen side of my district, one in the Brooklyn side of my district. And this is the largest contract in the history of the New York State Department of Transportation and will receive over $670 million in federal funding and an additional $130 million in state funding. And uh, what I've learned is you not just get the money, but you've got to be there and on top of it and reviewing it and making sure that it is built. And, uh, and uh, one of the uh, primary roles of, of government is, not, is to protect our people and to help rebuild after disasters. And certainly our greatest disaster was 9-11. Uh, the congressional de delegation, our senators and Congress members uh, fought very hard to get well over $20 billion for rebuilding down at Ground Zero and over $60 billion along with New Jersey and other states to rebuild after Sandy. Uh, the job of rebuilding is not complete and uh, we need to work to protect our investment and uh, that is why Homeland Security is my absolute uh, top priority. Uh, after 9-11, a, a Republican named Chris Shays uh, from New Jersey, uh, we, we created the 9-11 caucus 
uh, which was, uh, in my opinion, one of the best examples of government working uh, together. We passed legislation calling for a commission, a bipartisan commission, to look at what happened and to come back with a report on what we could do to make our country safer. In the beginning, both the Republican leadership and the Democratic leadership opposed our commission. They later supported it. But the commission uh, was headed by two great uh, Americans. One was former Congressman Lee Hamilton and the former Republican governor from New Jersey, Tom Keene. And they made a pact that they would do everything together, share all information, go to every meeting together. And uh, they worked together in a, an incredibly effective bipartisan way. And they issued uh, the 9-11 Commission report. This report reads like a novel. It uh, sold more copies than Harry Potter. I even nominated it for the National Book Award. They didn't win, but they should have. And the report outlined over 40 recommendations uh, to make our country safer. Congress, in a bipartisan way, worked together to implement most of them. The, the most important uh, recommendation was that our intelligence system was not effective. It was outdated. It wasn't up to the challenge, and that it had to be completely changed. And what came out of it was a total reorganization of our intelligence system and our homeland security. It was the biggest reorganization of our government since 1948, when we created the CIA. Uh, prior to 9-11, we had over 22 different intelligence or security agencies that would not, in some cases, even talk to each other. And in some cases, they were legally prohibited from talking to each other. And so we knew that we needed a very uh, drastic change. One story that Lee and uh, Governor Kane told me, I think, sort of capitalizes what, what a terrible situation we are in. And they told the story of a meeting that they had with George Tenet, who was then the head of the CIA. And they were asking him, was he aware of the terrorists, the, the men who wanted to learn how to fly, but not how to land? And he said, yes, we were tracking daily 15 of them. And then they asked, what did you do with that information? He said, nothing, because by law we were prohibited from talking to the FBI and other intelligence agencies. So this bill broke down those barriers and literally required them to talk to each other. Uh, we now have anti-terrorism units across the nation that brings all level of government together to share information uh, with uh, the police that are on the ground. The New York Police Department tells me that there have been 16 different attempts to harm New York since 9-11, but our law enforcement and our intelligence system has prevented their actions and, 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 and really saved lives and saved our people. But we remain, according to the security briefings that we get, New York remains a terrorist uh, target number one in our country. And uh, so we really, really uh, have to be on our toes uh, in, in making sure that we are protecting our citizens. I'm very proud of this bill. Uh, people ask me all the time, what are you most proud of? I would say working on this 9-11 uh, recovery bill, but also this intelligence reorganization to really uh, protect our people. Um, you'll remember that after 9-11, and, and uh, Bill Rudin touched on it, you couldn't even build a hot dog stand. Uh, building completely stopped. It was like a, like a dead zone. And uh, one of the reasons uh, is that you couldn't even get any form of property casualty insurance. It, it was so bad that the only place that anyone could get any insurance was going to London and, and partnering with Lloyds of London. Um, and, and, and in another example of bipartisanship, uh, and I would say the leadership of the business community uh, that worked very, very hard, uh, we created a bill called the Terrorism Risk Insurance. Uh, it, it, it passed. It was uh, deadlined in five years. And uh, with the incredible work of uh, Chuck Schumer and, and Charlie Rangel and others, uh, we were able to reauthorize that important bill. Um, it was uh, a, national, uh, a national issue, and we had to make it a national issue. And it was absolutely huge for this city. We would not be able to build without the insurance plan that we were able to pass on the federal government. And, 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 but one of the toughest fights that we've had was uh, the one that should be the easiest, and that is giving the health care 
to the men and women who risk their lives to save others, give them the health care and support that they so justly deserve. And uh, we know that 9-11 uh, was an environmental disaster, and many of the people who worked there became sick, and many have died since 9-11 because of the toxins that they inhaled. We lost uh, roughly 3,000 people on 9-11, but thousands, thousands more lost their health and are sick and dying. It took us nine years to pass the bill, and they capped it to five years. It has now expired, so we have to reauthorize this incredibly important bill. And if we do not reauthorize it, uh, many of our heroes and heroines uh, will literally die because they will not have the health care that they deserve. Uh, the, the attacks may have happened in, in New York and Pennsylvania and Washington, but people living in 433 of the 435 districts uh, came either as responders or survivors or volunteers and were there to help uh, clean up, help us rebuild. And they suffer now from a host of problems uh, from breathing the toxic fumes there at Down Ground Zero. So right now we have over 240 co-sponsors in the House uh, for my bill uh, to make these programs permanent. We have over 61 in the Senate, and uh, Kirsten and Chuck have done a great job in the Senate. It is filibuster-proof, um, and that's amazing support. But, uh, but uh, on the day that pa Paul Ryan was sworn in, they put in another two bills that completely gut the program, cap it, uh, do not fund it adequately, and make the pay for Medicare. Well, you know we're not going to be taking money out of Medicare, so in effect killing the program. I want to say that the leaders of labor here, I want to thank them for their leadership on making this happen. It was many, uh, many of our police and fire and construction and laborers that were at, at Ground Zero, and they are going to Washington on Tuesday of next week to yet again lobby and try to get this important bill passed. We need to pass it by Christmas, and I want to thank them for their leadership. As we all know, Speaker Boehner stepped down, and we have a new speaker. And uh, during that transition uh, period, we did see some real progress. We, we passed a continuing resolution that funds the government through December 11th, and the, the House finally passed a long-term transportation bill. It's not fully funded, but at least we passed one. And we reauthorized the very important Export-Import Bank that helps us finance our exports. It, it's an incredibly important uh, um, program. Uh, Speaker Ryan has been on the job for two weeks, but one thing I've seen from him over the years, he's very approachable. We work together on, on the census uh, and other projects. He's accessible. He listens to people. I'm always an optimist, and we will be trying very hard to get his support uh, for the Zadroga Act and other important legislation that is for New York. I, I'd like to uh, uh, wrap this up by saying that Congress could learn a great deal from ABNY. Uh, you come together from political uh, different parties, you come together from different industries, and you each have uh, uh, different priorities. And I would say some of you are even competitors, and yet you all work together to make this city a better place. Uh, Congress should be doing the same thing, working together to answer the problems, and I hope our new speaker will lead us in that direction. It is a thrill and my, an honor to see all of my old friends and have the opportunity to make new ones here in this incredibly important organization. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Congresswoman, and thank you uh, for your tremendous leadership and uh, everything you've done.